Jonathan Moore right here, and he's gonna he's gonna do a little talk for us. So please welcome him. So here we go. Today I'm talking about like designing experiences people love, and so. You know, I think that, you know, we're going to hear this, this theme kind of continuing on this whole entire session here, this whole entire, you know, weekend, as, uh, as people are talking about, you know, this, this whole idea of design and, like, what we can do with design and, and where we can take it. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you along in my journey of going from, my, from clients to actually designing products and, you know, like, like Cameron said, creating something meaningful. So the other thing too is like also how to dump your clients. So just to completely get rid of them, made that transition about two years ago. Had a successful interactive studio um, that we had great clients. Um, you know, we had a lot of fun doing a lot of client services and took that transition to actually selling digital products. And so it was, you know, it was like this, this crazy journey to be able to go from that you know, uh, dealing with deadlines and clients to be able to switch over. But it ultimately gave us more creative control over what we wanted to do. We have the freedom now that we can say, you know, what do we want to do? Where do we want to go? As opposed to being dictated by, you know, the, the campaign that Microsoft is wanting to do or, or this big project that, that the client is wanting to do. And so that, that freedom is what I, you know, strive for. Um, and then also, I mean, even some of the, the realistic things of like more predictable income. You know, I mean, whenever you're working with clients, it's up and down, but, but with products, you can actually build on that over time. And then, uh, like I said, you know, the ability to just ask, okay, we've done this, now what do we want to do next? So this is me on Twitter. If you want to tweet me or say anything about it, just at more. All right, then. Actually, you'll need the necessary application for authorization. Uh, you'll need some release forms. Uh, decibel level. What? Is something wrong? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> it's my eye. Why would we want to look at your eye? Is there something wrong with that weird eye? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with my eye. This one just has no pigment. You see, I'm what you call a partial ocular albino. But I'm fine. I have perfect 2020 vision with both eyes. Mr. Campbell, you're serious about putting on a rock concert. Are you kidding? I'd give my right eye. <laughs> <laughs> you both realize there are certain jurisdictions you'll need to follow. Well, I'd like to think that I have an eye for details. <laughs> <laughs> so as designers, I think we have like that crazy eye, like, you know, especially in this room here, because like no other profession, I mean, we have, you know, you look at the other design professions and you look at something like architecture and, you know, they can be able to see an empty space and figure out, you know, how can we, you know, design this in a way so that people can go in and they're enticed and, you know, have, inspired by the space and fill it. But ultimately, they have to rely on, you know, contractors and they have to rely on specialists the whole way to be able to, to put it all together and, and resources and funds, and, and it's a lot bigger than just one person. But, you know, most of us in the room as designers or developers, we have that same ability to be able to look at a trend, to be able to look at a problem and figure out, you know, how can we take it from, you know, all these disorganized bits or see this hole in this kind of gap of, of an opportunity and be able to kind of navigate our way to be able to organize it all together. And so we can, you know, we have that unique gift and that ability to be able to connect together. And, you know, I mean, there's nothing stopping most of us here, especially the ones that we can kind of straddle the fence between design and development, to be able to, you know, take an idea, latch a hold of it, and just start going with it. You know, I mean, maybe down the road you have to, to bring on a developer, but we have that ability. And so, you know, we have to make sure that we're, we're taking advantage of that, that, that ability. I, I think that at the same time, too, like it makes us naive thinking, you know, we can tackle absolutely any problem or any any trend or opportunity. And I see that all the time. And I mean, even like non-digital stuff, I think I drive my wife crazy. Like, I'll see a trend or I'll see something and, um, you know, think, you know, oh, I could do that, too. You know, I mean, just, I mean, you can look at like popsicles. Like, I think that, you know, I could go out and start a popsicle business. You know, I mean, I think that there's a lot of room for that um, to be able to do something different. You know, I mean, you do some like kind of fancy 
popsicles and put some good branding on it. Um, or even this since, like, you know, I mean, I, I look at this, this has nothing to do with, with the digital or the web, but, you know, we actually have two of these in our office right now. I'm not going to say which ones. But I'll, like, walk into, like, anthropology, and I'm thinking, like, you know, why is it that, you know, they couldn't have something like this for dudes that, you know, it, you can get away with some of the same sense, but just slap different branding on it. You know, so we're just constantly seeing these opportunities and figuring out, you know, how, how can we take advantage of them? And this is not what I'm talking about, like, guy sense right here. I'm kind of terrified, you know, with this man town. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like some basketball going on right there. I, I don't even want to know. <laughs> or even, like, something as simple as, like, donuts. Like, I mean, that's... Everywhere you go, it doesn't matter if you're here in San Diego or you're in Iowa, you're going to expect the exact same thing if you go into a donut shop. They're going to have the, you know, the cream fill, they're going to have the chocolate glaze, you know, why not just completely do something different? You know, this is actually a peanut butter and jelly donut that I had in, in New York a few weeks ago. And it was amazing. It's like, you know, why are people not doing that, that same thing and kind of captivating this trend and to be able to create something new? So I, I think that... You know, I mean, we're playing with that. You know, whether it's digital or the physical, we, we see these problems and these opportunities. Um, this is uh, Alexis, and he uh, he's famous for starting Reddit, Breck Pig, and Hipmunk. And he had a great quote recently that when I heard him speak up at uh, the Behance conference, where he said, you know, what he does is he looks for examples of horrible design, and that's where he draws inspiration for a good product. You know. To be able to take something that is a good idea, but it's just executed and designed horribly, and to be able to evolve on that. And, and the example that he had with, with Hipmunk is he would look at the travel sites, and you would search for a flight from, say, LAX to JFK, and, you know, you scroll all the way down to the bottom. You know, you have your list of, you know, $400, $300, you know, kind of normal flights. But if you go all the way down to the bottom, there's pagination, and there's, like, on page number 47, you can find a flight that costs you five grand and like has ten layovers and just a ridiculous amount of stops. It's like that's horrible design. You know why not completely remove that and just you know if you were to tell somebody I'm going to start a travel site for you know handling uh, you know travel searches, you'd probably think well you know it's been done. But there still is room and opportunity with good design to be able to create something that that has value. And so looking at design. It, you know, this, this quote right here, it, you know, makes a lot of sense. You know, it says, a, a head start means that you're paving a, the way for your competitors, and that's a noble but not very profitable thing to do. Um, so, you know, it, it, being first and being the first one to, to venture out and to do something, it doesn't have to be a big grand idea. It's just a matter of, of, you know, figuring out, you know, how can we improve on it and how can we make it even better. So in talking about design, I want to spread it out and look at it in a lot wider sense. I think that we're all used to, you know, the typical things that we relate to with, with design. Um, but, you know, looking at design, I like this quote. It's a little bit too, you know, I don't know, too polished. But it, it says that the overt and thoughtful development of the interaction points between you and your customer. So, you know, if we look at design in the sense of, you know, it's more than just the colors or more than just the fonts. You know, we need to start looking beyond the pixels. You know, what, what is it that we can design, uh, you know, that actually has, like, a, an impression on whether it's a user or a client or anything that we create? You know, and again, it's just going beyond the, the buttons and the colors and the interface. There's so much more to design uh, that we can begin to tap into and use that same skill that we have of being able to, to kind of see that opportunity and, and designing for it. Design is not limited to the things with buttons. This idea expands to designing all the interactions people have with the product that create or destroy the relationships people have with your company. I, we just recently moved on Wednesday, so you know it's been a little bit hectic, and I was planning on working on all these slides on Wednesday night. You know, I had all the boxes made it into the house. We had already set up internet. So it was just a matter of just plugging in the, the cable modem, you know, and I was good to go to be able to, to work on all this. And so I go to do it, none of the outlets are working. I'm like, ah, oh, this is, you know, this is not good. Like, it's, the lights are not blinking. So I call the company, I call Cox, and, and I'm on the phone with them. And, you know, of course, there's this big, long phone tree that takes me about five minutes to be able to get through to, to what it is that, that, you know, I need to do. I just need to connect to the Internet. 
And then so finally, while I'm on hold, it said, you know, we have an automated troubleshooting uh, process that, you know, will help get you on there. So it's like this whole, you know, this recorded message that is asking you to, okay, now I'll unplug your modem. Now plug it back in. Now how many likes do you see? And just taking you through this, and it was the most painful thing ever. And, you know, as a result, I hated everything to do with that company. And, you know, it's like you look at something like a cable company and you think, you know, if they actually cared about, you know, that, that notion of design and designing every single interaction that a customer has with them, would they be in the problems that they are today? Whenever I was working on this, this uh, you know, writing out all, everything for this conference, I had, you know, it was such a crazy time between moving and, and handling the, the business and all sorts of stuff that I had to just, you know, kind of completely get away and, uh, you know, near, uh, near where our office is, just a few short miles, there's a Ritz-Carlton. I didn't go check in there, but I, my sister, she actually had an idea. It's like, you know, why don't you just go there and they have like a nice outdoor area, just set up and, you know, write. So it was like, you know, that would be a good spot to do that. You know, it would be a nice view. This is actually the view from the table that I was sitting at. Not bad at all. So, but whenever you're there, you know, you have this whole entire sense of, 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 you know, what their brand is all about. And you're overwhelmed with it by the moment you walk in the door. I mean, even down to, like, you know, all these little details that they did that, that made up the whole entire experience, down to the smell. It smelled like, you know, flowers, not in a way of, like, they had a candle lit lit like the man scent or anything like that, but, you know, it was like it actually smelled like fresh flowers, even down to the visuals, the, you know, the metal sculptures that they had there, the lighting, the way that they had the windows open, um, you know, the, the staff, they, the people that you actually see walking by, it didn't matter if it was, you know, possibly a manager or, you know, a bellman or whoever, they actually looked at you like in your eyes and said, you know, how are you doing today? And, you know, I think we, we get that a lot, you know, you know, at this hotel or other restaurants where people ask that question, but rarely do people, like, look you square in the eye and ask you that. And so it was just like, you know, this combination of all these different things, even down to taste. Like, I sat outside, like, on this little, like, patio area, and they came over and they brought this, like, free basket of chips with white truffle oil and little mustard flakes on it. It's like, you know, all these things, you know, all these details, that, all of that ultimately boiled down to, to my perception of what their brand was, and, and they are all purposely designed elements that they created. So this is the company that, that I run along with uh, with two others full-time and a handful of contractors. It's Style Hatch, um, and, and the, our entire goal is we're trying to focus on design in the same way. You know, yes, like, of course we want to make sure that we have beautiful looking buttons and navigation, all these little details, but at the same time, like, what can we do to design these, these interactions that, that people love? Um, and, you know, how can we focus on, on all those details? And, and this, you know, talking about the purpose and what, what Cameron was talking about, this right here sums up our purpose. And, you know, we're, we're helping people show off their genius. That right there is, like, the, the main purpose that we have in, in everything that we do. And, you know, everything needs to follow this checkpoint. And it's like, you know, I mean, the designs can fulfill that, the physical designs, what we do in Photoshop, but what can we do beyond that to be able to, to fulfill that, that need? So the first phase of the company is actually providing fresh designs. So what we want to do is, is we actually have premium themes that we sell. And so, you know, in the same way that they could get a new shirt or, you know, I got a haircut yesterday, you, you want to do those little things to just feel comfortable. And what we do with these themes is we, we provide the, the, that kind of same sense. It's like, you know, getting a new outfit and, it, you know, charging 50 bucks. It's like the same price as a shirt. And we see a lot of people that they'll buy a theme and then, you know, a month later they'll buy it again. But ultimately it comes down to, to a design that they feel comfortable in to be able to share their, their ideas and their right, you know, to write and to, you know, just share what they're passionate about. And it's like ultimately those things that, that they're sharing in that comfort level that they have that amounts to their genius that they have and, and what makes them interesting. I mean, you have like, you know, shirts, like, it's the same type thing, you know. We're going to be hearing from uh, Sheldon here in a little bit, but, you know, it's, it's that same thing, like, you know, that, that, that feeling that you get whenever you buy a new shirt and you put it on, and then, you know, or even like a watch or, or a haircut, you know. <laughs> Didn't quite go for that one. But right now, we, we focus exclusively on Tumblr. I think that it's a very unique platform. 
they're, they've kind of set themselves up as the world's creators to be able to, to have a blogging platform from that. You know, and we have like the widest range of people that are buying the themes. Everybody from you know legit supermodels to like horse industry experts to vegan you know chefs to you know just like all over the place. And the reason why we're focusing in on that is because they they have some pretty amazing stats and they're they're growing rapidly across the world. Uh, even like right now, they just launched some more languages, so we're up to 17 languages. So in the way that it works, you know, we can launch a theme, and they can flip a switch and change it to uh, Hungarian, and then instantly everything is translated to, to that language for them. Right now, we have 17 themes. Um, you know, this actually, this number I was looking at is actually higher than that. We've gone through 32,000 support emails in the last two years. Um, We've had 148 updates to the theme, so we spent a lot of time, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, those those interaction points that we have with the customers that they're, you know, they're there and that they have a good feeling for the work that we do. So, you know, going back to the phase, like the, the first phase, we're focusing on the aesthetics, and the, this happens to be the the Tumblr theme. It's a very simple idea and a very basic idea that we're we're working off of, but it's ultimately going to expand into other things that are still answering that that same that same, you know, that purpose of, you know, helping people to show off their genius and ultimately releasing the, uh, the tools to be able to do that and working on platforms that are unrelated to blogging. Uh, and then also knowledge, you know, what can we do to, to help people to share the knowledge that they have with other people at, at the same time as, you know, being able to, uh, to be able to kind of offer up, you know, online, you know, and, and help teach and train other people. So we have a team of uh, two full-time people right now, uh, Jess and Kristen, and uh, and then a handful of contractors, and then you know we're we are hiring too. So you know I mean if you're a front-end developer, designer, you know come talk to me. Um, so I, I think that it's like as we're going through this, it's important to kind of look at my the journey that I had that I you know got me to this point. So you know in the beginning, like I actually did not go to, to, to college, I did not, you know, like many of us, I think that, you know, the, the number of people that actually go to design school is becoming less and less. Um, I actually, right out of high school, I took an internship at a, uh, at a church of all places, and, uh, and, you know, I was helping out, leading the, they had like a whole entire junior high group that, you know, speaking on a weekly basis to about 150 kids. And you know you do just absolutely everything because you have no resources, you have no funds. So you gotta you gotta do whatever it takes to make things happen. So we're doing everything from you know like construction to planning big conferences, and even down to like you know I remember there was one time somebody said you know hey we need somebody to work on a flyer. So I, I just simply you know raised my hand and, and opened up you know uh, Paint, Microsoft Paint, trying to figure out like okay now how do I cut out the logo in Paint and couldn't quite figure it out, and that's when I was ultimately introduced to. To Photoshop 3 and the rest is history. So from there, I really ultimately realized that that necessarily wasn't the, the right direction. I fell in love in the process of, of working on that. Um, and then, you know, I had the right open door that I could go in and, you know, leave that. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to go work at, at some studio or some agency living in Dallas at the time. And here I was, you know, I was 20, maybe 21 had no, you know, official education and no real portfolio. So, you know, of course I couldn't find a job, so I, I started freelancing. Um, you know, and it was it was completely the type of thing where it was like, you know, I would get a client and said, hey, can you do prep work? Sure, you know, I'll figure it out along the way. Or, you know, I even had like a minor league hockey team that needed a content management system in Cold Fusion. <coughs> Anybody remember Cold Fusion? Like, a long time ago. And so, you know, it literally was the type of thing like, I opened up a book to page one of the book as I was working on the project and just kind of worked my way through it. You know, as a result, like it was nonstop working. Like I was working all the time because you know I was not only trying to get the project done, but I was learning along the way. Uh, you know, after that, I actually moved to California about eight years ago and I uh, worked at a, a flash company called Two Advance. I was actually like there from. Blue site, if you're familiar, through the red site, and uh, and then to the uh, Mayan temple site. Um, so, you know, that whole entire experience there, you know, it, it was you know a very unique environment in the sense that that everybody is expected to be a jack of all trades, where you had to 
be able to handle design and animation and be able to carry it all the way through. And there was even that expectation that you had to manage your own clients. They had no project managers for like the first you know, three of the four years that I was there. And so it was a very unique environment. But at the same time, too, I was, I'm so thankful that I, I went through that because now it changed the way that, you know, the way that I, I, I kind of view the work that, that I do and the way that I approach projects. And I, I think that, you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of debate, you know, whether if you should specialize or if you should just be really broad. And, you know, this is the quote that everybody goes back to, Jack of all trades, master of none. But the rest of it, the complete rest of the quote is, but certainly better than a master of none. And so, I mean, that, that's, you know, I, I think that that's one thing that I'm definitely passionate about. If you've gone down the route of design or if you've gone down the route of development, there always is room to, to begin to overlap. And, and ultimately what it does is it opens up the door for more opportunities to different type of projects that you can work on. And then also, you know, it, it also gives you a sense of empathy that you can begin to, you know, you may not necessarily ever master development, but it gives you empathy to be able to, to lead a developer or to lead a team of developers and to understand, you know, the basics of what's going on to be able to, to relate and, you know, ultimately create better products. Um, you know, and then after that, went on, created a, a studio that, you know, we had a bunch of great clients, um, you know, amazing, fun clients that, you know, we had a blast with that, you know, we got to do some pretty cool stuff. But ultimately, it came down to this, this whole sense of you know, family versus clients. And, and right at the time whenever I started the studio and, and left and went off on my own, like the, the timing was terrible. I just had a, a six-month-year-old girl. And I, you know, like, like I said, there there's never is a good time to be able to do any of those things. But we always just have to just kind of leap and, and just kind of go for it. And this was the big motivation, the reason why I left you know, working at, at like an ad agency, at, you know, at, at all sorts of different ones that I was working at, because I wanted to have that ability to be able to kind of balance that time a little bit more. And, and of course, you know, foolishly going into this, that ultimately caused more more conviction or more it caused more uh, of, a, of a you know problem between like trying to balance, find that balance between you know how much client work do I take on as opposed to you know actually seeing my family on the weekend. You know, thankfully along the way, like, you know, I, I kind of, we kind of adopted the, the value-based pricing model and never charged by the hour. So it definitely helped along the way to be able to, to set, you know, higher prices. And, and in fact, you know, I mean, I'd love to talk, give a whole entire session on that of, of you know, ways that you can change up your pricing to, to be able to value it. Because I think as designers, we often give away our best ideas or the, the strategy and the thought that we put into it, a part of the pitch of, of winning the work. And then we charge for the production work, the design that you know that ultimately is a commodity. But you know this is this is a typical cycle that, that you have whenever you're working with clients. You know it's a lot of ups and downs, and as as you're coming off a project, you have to start ramping up for the next one. And so you know it, all, it, it is, as I, as you're going along, like ultimately I would have to start you know bringing on more and more people so that I could kind of stabilize that line and to be able to, to kind of get some consistency to it. Um, but, you know, ultimately I was, I was the bottleneck in, in that, you know, that whole entire equation in managing the business. And ultimately I had a, a wake-up call of three different things that happened. I had a vacation that I was, you know, away with my family and, and uh, I remember thinking, you know, okay, I got everything lined up with clients, you know, everything's taken care of, everything's covered, we just launched a project. And so on day number two, I get a call from Microsoft, and uh, they were saying, hey, you know, we, uh, we talked to our lawyers, and, you know, the video that you did, you actually made up a name that you used. And I was like, yeah, I mean, it's not anybody's real name. Well, we actually have, we have an approved list of fictitious names that you have to use. You know, I mean, these are actual employees that signed away their rights, saying that, you know, we can use their names. So it was like, you know, this, this whole entire experience of, you know, no matter what you do, like, ultimately, you know, you're at the mercy of, of, of the clients and the directions that they're wanting to pull you. And then also I had a, I had a talk with an, you know, a very wise kind of old ad agency, you know, partner of the, this great agency up in, in Seattle. And he was giving me this whole entire story of, you know, how they, they grew and grew. And ultimately they were, their, their biggest vulnerability was just, you know, these big clients they had to have on board to be able to sustain, like, all these talented people that they had. And if the moment that that one of them leaves or it goes in jeopardy, 
it can flip, you know, decades worth of work. Um, and then, you know, at the same time too, like, you know, at the height of it, like business was going really good, but there was always, you know, these projects that would come in on Friday afternoon where, you know, it's like, okay, we need something ready to go by Monday morning. And so, you know, you would do it and charge three times the price, but at the same time, it's like, I, I'm not willing to sacrifice this. And, you know, it, just this culmination of all these different things, like, it started hitting me. It's like, you know, this, I, I gotta go in a different direction. And, um, you know, I, I wanna be able to have some a little bit more control. So this right here is kind of like a fateful email that I got um, from somebody at Tumblr, from Peter at Tumblr, that subject line is, is your theme. And then the message is, uh, is really pretty. Would you ever make a public theme? That, that right there is like what the smallest idea and you know I mean it's not even necessarily in the matter of like like it's you know I'm saying all of you guys should go out and do Tumblr themes but it's just all of, all about just finding like that smallest thing and figuring out how do we act on it how do we manage it and you know the, the whole idea was you know maybe if I could just you know have a little bit of products here and there it could it could uh, help us get a little bit more selective and stabilize you know, the business so we can grow a little bit easier, or if nothing else, it just buys me lunch every day. Um, you know, but by the time we got the second one launched and the third one just in this like window in between projects, you know, I kind of did the only logical thing and it just jumped and just jumped into it. And so at that point, in uh, the middle of 2010, we decided, you know what, let's stop taking on new clients and let's just focus on this and our existing clients. And so over the course of six months, we completely transitioned the company from, from handling clients to just focusing on products. And again, it was the simplest idea, but it was just a matter of like acting on it and just you know staying with it and making some sacrifices and taking a little bit of risk. Um, and then that's what birthed Style Hatch. So again, the humble idea and just expanding it out. Um, the biggest challenge that we face is, is not the lack of inspiration, but pushing an idea forward in the glut of inspiration. There's inspiration all around us, and I'm sure, like, you know, in this room of about 100 people, we all have probably 10 ideas on our list of, of something that we want to execute. So there certainly is not a lack of inspiration. It's a matter of just finding your way through that. You know, I'm fascinated by this, you know, this whole entire journey from, you know, like an idea to an action. And, you know, along, along the way, there's lots of turns and detours and sidetracks. Um, you know, and ultimately it's, you know, how do we get from, from this idea and actually making it happen and seeing it, seeing it, in, you know, materialize. You know, our, I, our mind is an idea factory and it's like, you know, we, we have all of that. We have our list of ideas and, you know, how do we best manage that? You know, the, the solution that I found is, you know, I have to write it down because otherwise, like, if I'm, I'm constantly thinking of, like, okay, I want to do this, this, and this, you know, it's just taking up space in my head, so I actually have a notebook that I'll sit there and I'll write everything down because I only have room for maybe one, maybe two ideas that I'm actively thinking on and allowing to kind of just move around in my head. If you ask, like, most people in this room, like, you know, what is it that's holding you back from being able to, to kind of step out on this and just kind of dabble with this product idea, you know, going from, like, client to product, you know, I think the biggest answer that we, we get, you know, the biggest thing that we always say is, you know, I just simply don't have the time. But I think it, more than that, it, it boils down to, you know, a little bit of fear. Because it's like, you know, am I, if I'm going to sacrifice this opportunity with a client, um, you know, is it going to all pan out? Like, is all this work going to, to amount to, to nothing if it doesn't work out? You know, and ultimately, it you know, it's just that process of, of just acting on it and just continuing forward in one after another. And it's ultimately just all these baby steps that you got to take along the way.
see when you see title exactly how it could help. Baby steps? It means setting small, reasonable goals for yourself one day at a time. One tiny step at a time. Baby steps. <laughs> for instance, um, when you leave this office, don't think about everything you have to do in order to get out of the building. Just think of what you must do to get out of this room. And when you get to the hall, deal with that hall and so forth. You see? Baby steps. Baby steps. Oh boy. Baby steps. Baby steps. Baby steps through the office. Baby steps out the door. It works. It works. All I have to do is take one little step at a time, and I can do anything. Baby step around the office. Baby step around the office. That should give you a lot to digest while I'm on vacation. Vacation? Oh, certainly, my secretary told you. As of this afternoon, I'm taking my family on vacation until Labor Day. That's a month. What if I need you? What if I need to talk? Well, my associate, Dr. Harmon, would be happy to talk. And Bob, I'll be back. Just read Baby Steps. Uh, baby Steps, out of the office. Very good. Baby steps to the hall. Very good, Bob. Keep going. That's it. Bye. I'll see you in a month. Baby steps to the elevator. Baby steps to the elevator. Baby steps. Baby step onto the elevator. Baby steps into the elevator. I'm in the elevator. Just starting, just you know, it, like that. I think that that's the biggest thing. You know, we, we we get so focused on you know, I gotta have this all lined up right, and I gotta have the timing and everything. But ultimately, <coughs> it just comes down to just taking that first step and just moving forward and pushing that idea through. You know, all the other inspiration and everything else that we have that you know holds us back. You know, and, and learning to be present. This is one thing that you know I I've, I've really kind of to focus in on because I think that you know there's so many things that, that you know surround us with you know trying to captivate our attention whether if it's tweets or or Facebook or I mean you even go uh, like to a conference and half the time you know everybody's looking down at their phones you know we're supposed to be interacting with with you know everybody else in this room but at the same time we're so you know enthralled with with what's happening and you know, in our attempt to truly connect with everything that is happening now, we surrender our own ability to be present. And I think that, you know, at times, like, we have to find that balance between, you know, am I going to be, you know, connected and seeing what's happening, but also at the same time learning when to shut it all off and just to go in and focus in. At the same time, learning to design with conviction and make decisions with conviction. The thing that drives me crazy is, you know, as much as I love Dribble and this, you know, some of these other tools out there, I always, you know, I hate it whenever I see a designer post up something and then they're overwhelmed with comments, like trying to sway them, oh, you should do this, change this and that. But ultimately, you have to make, you know, design decisions and feedback is great and I, I think that there's definitely a need to be able to hone something in and, and there's room for that. But at the same time, like, we have to make these decisions with convictions, and, and that, that ability to be able to, to do that is, is what's going to give us that confidence to be able to move forward our idea from an idea to actually seeing it happen. And going back to, like, designing experiences that people love and looking beyond the pixels, there's one thing that I learned whenever I was working with clients that, that you know, an agency that I was working with, that they, they said something that stuck with me, and it's like, you know, your job as a designer or your job as a developer is not simply to create what you think is best for the client, but your goal is to make the person that you're working with and the company a hero at their company. That right there, if you can get that and learn to set your ego on the shelf, 
you know, you can do amazing things and earn great trust with that client if you just focus on it in that same way. And I think that that same mentality works for products. Um, you know, these three things, if I could boil it down to absolutely anything, these three things, service details and purpose, I think have more weight and more effect over the business and sales and revenue, all these type of things, than even design itself. Like, you know, you can have beautiful design, but if you don't nail these, you know, these elements of design, um, you know, ultimately you're missing out on, on the, the most potential. Customer service is the pure, one of the purest forms of branding. It's your opportunity to actually make a real impression with somebody. Somebody that actually is using your product, that needs help, or actually wants to give some feedback, all these type of things. This is your one chance. We actually have like everywhere, you know, all over the site, everything. You know, we're pushing people to our email addresses because we understand that that's like an opportunity. There was actually a friend of mine that that he has a great startup in the Bay Area that he saw our site. He's like, you know what? But guys should probably like, you know, hide your support a little bit. You could reduce the amount of emails that you get, but I actually want more. Like, you know, I, I think that that if we can have that opportunity to be able to spend three minutes with somebody. We can make an impression that, that changes their, their view of the company and what it is that we do. We spend a lot of time, and this is just from like last month, you know, the amount of time that we're, we're, we're spending with everybody. And it, you know, you look all the way over on the far right hand side, the average handle time is 3 minutes and 58 seconds. So you know, that 3 minutes and 58 seconds that we're spending on an email to help somebody it makes the world of a difference in, in the product and their perception of what the brand is and, and their love for, for the products. You know, I mean, the most important thing is to set expectations. Whenever somebody emails in, we automatically fire back an autoresponder, giving them what the office hours are and they know, and then also through the reputation that they know that we're going to get back and we're going to help them and go above and beyond and reply quickly. You know, I mean, even, you know, over in the mornings, you know, we'll have like, you know, 60 emails waiting for us that we have to kind of go work through. And we could go, you know, the oldest one first, answering them, but we actually choose to, like, pick the most recent emails because if we can, you know, fire off a response five minutes after somebody emailed in, whenever we're, we're going through support, either in the morning or in the, the evening, um, you know, that right there will blow them away that we responded within five minutes. But if somebody's already been waiting for three hours, you know, waiting three and a half hours, they're still, you know, thrilled with that. Uh, be personable. You know, we, we take a minute, you know, instead of just, you know, how do you do this? And we reply back, well, you do this, this, and this. We'll actually go to their site and, you know, a lot of times even comment about a blog post that they had. You know, it's just those little things. We're looking for those little opportunities to, to be able to, to kind of be personable with them. You know, I mean, just even down to the, the tone of the writing that we have and the autoresponders and, you know, this is what somebody gets if it's out of office hours and it says, you know, uh, we're, we're devoting 100% of our attention to one of the following activities, eating, hanging out with our lovely spouses and children, sleeping, surfing, or wrestling sharks with our bare hands. You know, I mean, just even like the, the little casual tone with that, I, I can't tell you how many people have commented on that and that's actually, you know, involved into these whole conversations. Um, you know, going above and beyond of you know what it is that they expect that we're going to reply to, and you know there's times where somebody will ask for a question, we go to their site and we notice some other things that they may need help on, and we'll bring that up too. Um, even proactive, like at a certain point every day, like a part of our routine, and we don't we don't spend all of our time doing these things. We spend it in, in bursts, but we'll go through like people that have recently purchased themes and, and hop on Twitter if they have a Twitter account listed. We'll thank them for buying, and then at times too, like. Hey, we noticed that your button, you know, you need to add HTTP before your link, otherwise it doesn't quite work. I mean, just little things like that um, to be able to kind of, you know, blow them away with, and ultimately this all has to do with design. Um, you know, as a result, we have a tremendous amount of people that are, that are you know, talking about Style Hatch and the brand, and, you know, even for the first year, we didn't have a website. Here we are, we're selling website themes and designs. We didn't even have one of our own. And when we did finally launch something of a website, it made no impact. You know, ultimately, this is what's been making the biggest impact. Um, and you can even go to twitter.com forward slash starhatch forward slash favorites if you want to see some of those tweets that people are sending to us that we're favoriting to, to just kind of archive it. 
uh, you know, and again, we have like all sorts of people. There was uh, a supermodel, Coco Rocha. I get this email and I didn't even know who it was. And she's, you know, saying, hey, I'm trying to change up this and this with the background. I added this to the CSS and I modified this HTML. And, and you know, we're going in and like finally making this connection. And I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. Like this girl who's currently on the cover of Vogue magazine is asking CSS and HTML questions. <laughs> but at the same time, too, like, you know, taking that time, and she began to talk about our brand. And as a result, we saw this huge surge of, like, the fashion industry, and it led to, like, you know, Nina Garcia, who is the, you know, judge for Project Runway, starting to use one of our themes. And we just saw this kind of, like, bubbling up, like, within this industry that I know nothing about. But just that simple, you know, interaction of taking some time on email resulted to tremendous things. And even down to, we have certain customers. This is, this is Seth. She has bought every single one of our themes maybe three times. I, yeah, I don't know. But anyways, I mean, you know, ultimately it came down, we've spent a lot of time on email with her and helping her out, but somehow, like, we'll launch a new theme, and within five minutes, sure enough, she's always the first person to, to buy the new one and finds an excuse to create a new blog or create you know something new on Tumblr just to use a theme. Software engineers and designers are often divorced from the consequences of their actions. And I think that that's one of the most important things is, is designers and developers get involved with the support and, and understand what it is that the needs are and where people are going with, with what it is that they need. I, I think that that is tremendously important. Focus on the details. You know, don't cut the corners in, in your product. You know, work on those little things that, you know, 95% of the people are never going to see or ever even realize or appreciate that it went to that level. But if you can, you know, focus on, like, those inside stitchings. I think of, like, you know, you look at certain types of clothing, you open it up, and you see this, like, all this stitch work, this detailed work that's on the inside of the clothing. It doesn't necessarily, you know, do anything to the outside of what other people, you know, see of these jeans. But it changes up your perception and also potentially you know, makes it a little bit more durable down the road. You know, focus on those details. The details are good for the creator's soul. Not only will you know, the, the users appreciate it, but whenever you go to that level, that process actually helps you, know, you refine your product and helps you refine what it is that you're doing. Um, have to, you know, and it'll give you focus in, in everything that you do if you focus on the details. I honestly believe that if you have any type of product that you're selling to people, if you were to focus on these two things, you may not get the, the actual design, the pixels right, you may not get a lot of things right, but if you do these two things, I'm convinced that you can launch any business online that, you know, maybe there already is that idea, but if you can do those two things better than, than the competitors, you're going to have a tremendous advantage. Um, and then ultimately, coming back down to purpose, you know, what is it that we're doing this for? Like, why are we doing all of this? And you know, what is what is the uh, you know the reasoning that you know kind of gets us beyond money and beyond you know fame or whatever you know it is that will drive some people? Because you will always make massive sacrifices for your purpose. Whatever it is that you have set out, you know, this is what I'm doing it for. You are going to make sacrifices. So if it's money, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But just be you know, go into it knowing that you are going to make sacrifices to make more money. Uh, there's this email, this this kind of question that, that I saw in Quora where, you know, somebody was asking, like, what does it feel like to be a CEO of a startup? And, and you can start to see the purpose and the motivations of this guy responding, and he gave this really long, you know, description of what it is, and I, I can't connect with it. Because, you know, he says, it's very tough to sleep most nights of the weeks. Weekends don't matter to you anymore. TV, vacation becomes so boring that when your company's future might be sitting in your inbox or the result of a new A-B test you decide to run. You feel guilty when you're doing something you like doing outside of your company. That is not what I want to have from the, the purpose of what it is that I'm doing. Like, and, and this may work tremendously well for him, and, and I'm sure he will find great success, but at the same time, those, you know, what his purpose is set up, he's making sacrifices for that. And for us, like, the first, you know, the first thing of uh, Style Hatch is we want to be able to give back, like, be able to have the resources to do something good with it, as opposed to just creating, you know, frivolous things for the web. You know, how we actually do that is we've decided to set aside 5% of all revenue. 
you know, nonprofits with revenue that we are, you know, giving back to different charity organizations. Last year was Charity Water. We raised a lot of money with them. But then this year is it's Children's Cup, which is an organization in Africa that, you know, is focused on five things. Food and water, food, uh, medical care, education, discipleship, and leadership development. These are, like, real things that, you know, if, if I realize that, you know, if I focus, like, on, on the purpose, you know, we want to be able to get back. I'm going to be making decisions differently about the business and where we're going with it or, you know, risks that we're taking because this is something that is important to us. You know, I mean, even to the point where we're looking at taking a trip over there in October to actually see it and to physically be there. Um, you know, value family to be able to, you know, with the client work to be able to shift over to products and be able to put that value back on family and, and make sure that I have my weekends, I have my nights. Um, to be able to spend time with family. It, to run a successful business, it doesn't take working nonstop. You can do this, like working 40 hours a week. I, a brilliant team. Like, I, I, that's the biggest thing that I want, is to have people around us that, you know, that we can all work together and be able to say, you know, what are we going to work on next? What are we going to do next? You know, I think that, uh, you know, that opens up so many doors and so many opportunities. And then creative freedom, like, you know, where, where are we going to go with this? Like, you know, what is the destiny of, of this company and these different phases? Or do you want to scrap it all and try something completely different? So ultimately, as we close, like, you know, I think all these things are great, but, you know, what is it that you're going to do with this now? You know, how, how can you move forward some of these ideas? And I think that, you know, the, the thing that we tend to do is we internalize all these ideas and we think that, you know, we got to lock them down, super secret mode. You know, but ideas are cheap, execution is everything. We hear that all the time. And, you know, again, with 100 people in this room, 10 ideas each, that's 1,000 ideas. Chances are there's all these overlapping ideas. Talk about them. You know, we're, we're all here in this room. We're all together for the next several days. Talk with each other about these ideas. And it, because that whole process of vocalizing it actually helps mature whatever it is that you're thinking or or one little conversation might spark an idea that kind of branches off or you never know you know maybe you'll find somebody that you're going to end up working with down the road to make some of these things happen and that's it